This next panel this afternoon is, is how we find a horse, how we acquire a horse to putting training uh, with a trainer. And we're going to focus on the, the people that do that and the processes um, that you have to go through that to do that. And I think if one tip you can take away from, from this conference over the next day and a half, I think this probably, as a potential owner, could be one of the most important, uh, important pieces of information that you're going to get, how to acquire the horse, the, your, your so-called sports franchise. So uh, in that honor, we're going to uh, we introduce our first panelist here in a second. He's a, he's a young man that grew up on the backsides of Southern California. He worked for various trainers along the way. His family's been involved in horse racing for a long time. Uh, he then went to college, graduated college, went to law school, became a lawyer. Um, and he then went into law practice. And uh, while he was practicing as a litigator, he formed some um, informal racing partnerships out in Southern California. He then decided to leave his law practice, went to work for Team Valor, and was part of the 2011 Kentucky Derby campaign with Animal Kingdom. Uh, he then left Team Valor and uh, started up his own partnership group uh, just several years ago called Eclipse Thoroughbreds. He's one of the bright young minds of our sport. Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Wellman. Good job, Aaron. Take a seat. Our next panelist um, is the president of West Point Thoroughbreds. It's a horse racing partnership he created in 1991. Uh, his passion from racing, as most of us involved in the sport, started as a youngster uh, while attending the races with his father. He's a graduate of the United States Military Academy and a former Army Ranger. His business model helps people of modest means get into the thoroughbred industry. When he started his partnerships, he started with two investors and a $5,000 claimer. As of today, he's got 400 investors and over 65 horses in training. He's the president of West Point Thoroughbreds. Please give a warm welcome to Terry Finley. Down. Terry, come on out. Take a seat. All right. Anyway, pick a spot. Um, Gentlemen, you've achieved great success uh, in your respective fields. Aaron, more recently. Terry, you've been involved a little longer. Um, let, let's, let's talk about this panel about acquiring a horse. How important is it um, to, to, to pick out a horse and, and, and the, the, the people you're using to pick that out? I mean, you don't just go to the sale and pick a horse out. Who are the types of people and what information do you garner to try and select a horse at a sale, for instance, Aaron? Well, before I answer your question, Simon, I just want to thank everybody at Ownerview for setting up this conference. I think it's a really, really positive step in the right direction to try to promote horse ownership. And I want to thank all of you guys that have attended this conference because ownership is the lifeblood of our sport. And for those of you that are looking to get involved in horse racing, um, the most important thing is that you apply yourself and you educate yourself and you learn to surround yourselves with the right people. So I applaud you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here. Um, and it's a real honor to be here myself, so thank you. So to get to your... Yeah, you know, how, how do you, you know, do you include the opinions <laughs> of others to, to buy and purchase horses, whether in your, both your cases it's at the sale or as a private purchase? Absolutely. Um, I think one of the themes that we're learning today is that it is a game of experts. And it's important to surround yourself with experts. Um, at the end of the day, all the buying decisions have to rest on mine and Terry's shoulders because we're the ones that have to answer to our partners, um, good or bad. Uh, but. I'm of the belief that uh, because it is a game of experts, there are some guys uh, that are really good at certain aspects of this industry. Um, there are a lot of guys that are very good at a lot of things, and there are some guys that are exceptional at very few things. Um, and I like to surround myself with the exceptional guys because that's the level that we try to compete on is the really high level. Um, so there's two genres of public auctions that we acquire horses from, uh, that being the yearling sales and the two-year-old in training sales. Um, I'm very fortunate uh, as far as the yearling sale capacity is concerned. Uh, one of my mentors and confidants in the yearling genre is uh, Hall of Fame jockey Eddie De La Husse, uh, who's been a longtime friend and mentor to, my, to me. Um, and he's been bringing me here to Keeneland to the yearling sales for probably a dozen or 15 years. Um, so Eddie is my main man uh, when it comes to the expertise as far as yearlings are concerned and he and I act as a team and uh, try to select the best yearlings we can. When it comes time for two-year-old season, um, a guy that I rely on very heavily is a man by the name of Gary Young 
who's a private clocker uh, out in Southern California and has been buying two-year-olds in training at auction for many, many years and, and bought several, several grade one winners. Um, Gary and I have developed a really good relationship at the sales. He's exceptional when it comes to the stopwatch. Uh, these are sort of the combines, if you will, of, of two-year-olds. And Gary's instrumental for me in assessing uh, the times, the gallop out times, and those things. So yeah, absolutely. It's important to lean on experts, to have a team environment. Um, but at the end of the day, the decision really needs to be yours, because you have to answer to the people that you're buying the horses for. What about you, Terry? I mean, I mean, the analogy to sports is that you're the general manager, and now you've got these scouts and these people looking for horses for you. And I'm sure, for sure there's many. Whether you're buying horses in Europe, you need another set of eyes over there. Who do you rely on? Yeah. Well, I'll second that. I'll second what Aaron talked about. I, I appreciate everybody uh, taking an opportunity to come out and uh, to learn about our great sport because it is an unbelievable sport, and uh, I'm very excited and I'm bullish about the, uh, the future. You know, the key is right that we all have to take responsibility and, and to bring new people in um, on the ownership side and on the betting side. So, right, they're the two people and, and the two uh, you know parts of our of our business that drive everything. So as it relates to our team, I'd like to think if right, you look around and, and you look at the successful owners and the successful teams in the business, right, they all have a top quality people. Um, and you, you talk about the sports franchise. I, I'd like to draw right, the analogy to like an NFL team. Right? There, aren't very, or there aren't a lot of people in the industry across the world that can compete and can buy the first round uh, draft picks time after time, right? Because, and there are people that, that every time you see them uh, in, in the results of the sale that, you know, they spend 500,000 and above. So what we'd, we'd like to think of is we're a team that really has developed an expertise to buy the, the kids that, well, in, in our case, the horses that are fifth round draft choices, right? That aren't gonna bring, you know, the ton of money uh, or, or the big dollars, right? But they have you know, the pedigree and, and they have the physicality right, to really be good prospects if you keep them sound and you put them in the right hands. So you know, our team, the composition of our team is not a whole lot different than, right, than a lot of other people. When we come to a, uh, it's like, uh, the yearling sales in uh, September at uh, Keeneland, after you get past the first couple days, you're looking at about 400 horses sold each day. So, so really the key is, is to have a system and to have a process and, and right, to have good people that follow that process. And I think uh, each year I'd like to think that we get a little bit better, right? but so do our competitors. Right? So it's, it's a game that you always have to get better in um, and you, you try to get better every day. And uh, I, I think that's one of the things that we love about our business is the competition because if you, if, if you don't get better every day and, and you don't improve and you're not looking at the environment, right, you're going to get run over on the racetrack and uh, at the sales. So, um, you know, I, I think things are so exciting in that respect. Real quick, who's some of the people you rely on? Like Aaron said he, different people for yearling sales, two-year-old yeah. sales. Do you take that same approach as well? Well, sure. Dr. Burke, who's going to come out in a, in a second, is our veterinarian. Mike Shannon, who, who's a, 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 a guy from Lexington does our short listing uh, and we use a technology company called DataTrack International and, and they actually provide us with information um, on, on the physicality of the horse as well as the biomechanical analysis and, and the heart score. And we used to I just actually come to the sale and if we saw horses that we felt good about, we, we sat down and we put a plan together to buy those horses. But now we use that data and I really think it gives us an edge, right, both to buy the horses and to identify the horses that we want to buy and also to the, identify the horses that we want to stay away from. And I, I think that's a distinction that's important because if you think about the sellers, right, their job is to bring the horses to auction um, as good as they can. And over the years, especially the top sellers, right, they've gotten very, very good uh, at uh, doing their job. So it, it's a competitive industry, especially um, it, at, in the auction ring. So you have to be careful and you have to do your homework and, and you have to know who you're dealing with. But um, I really, I love racing first and foremost. I love the excitement of, of, a, of a two year old going into the gate for the first time, but a close second is right, the auction ring. 
It leads me to my next question, what you're talking about confirmation. Aaron, when you go to a sale, obviously there's a checklist of myriad things that you're looking at. What's more important, confirmation, pedigree, physical looks? How do you weight each factor? You know, the easy question, the easier answer to that question yeah. is you got to factor it all in. Right. You really need to weigh all of the variables that go into buying a racehorse. To answer your question simply, um, for me, there's no question that physicality and confirmation trumps pedigree. Um, and that's related to what Terry was just talking about, is that when a horse is led into this ring, there's no draft order. There's no draft order that says that the Texas Rangers get to pick one, the New York Yankees get pick two. We're all trying to compete against the New York Yankees in here. And that means that you've got to have uh, a budget, and you've got to be very savvy about where you pick and choose your spots. Um, but as far as finding the athletes, uh, that's certainly, like Terry said, one thing that really gets my blood pumping. It's what gets me up every morning. Uh, aside from the racing and winning a big race, um, waking up every morning thinking that you could find that next great racehorse is, is really what drives me. Um, so I'm of the belief that while there is useful science out there that a lot of guys rely on, some more heavily than others, um, Finding athletes, finding equine athletes is an art, not a science. And that even drives the point home even that much harder that, uh, that it's a game of experts. And those guys with those instincts to be able to detect not just the best physically conformed horse, the best walker, uh, the best mover, um, but also those intangibles, the presence a horse has, the quality a horse has, the intelligence of a horse. Um, these are all things that uh, you know, horses can't speak to us, but they can communicate to us. And it's up to the really sharp eyes to be able to pick up on those communicative tools that horses are able to give to human beings. So for me, it's an art, not a science, and uh, definitely confirmation and physicality over pedigree. But at the same time, you've got to then go back to your catalog page and make sure that there sure. is some quality there so that if you are paying a certain amount of money for a horse, there's something for you to fall back on. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. You need to look at everything. I mean, you, you can't, I don't think in horse racing you can play the money ball effect. I don't know whether you know that movie about Oakland Raiders, how they, they draft baseball players by not watching them play, but literally off sheets and statistics. I think you have to go much further than that in this business, right? Well, I think you do, and I think you, you, you take it all into your algorithm that you use when you're, you're buying. But one of the things I, I think uh, the analogy is, right, you wouldn't want to have, if you saw a horse and he was a big, beautiful horse and he had, had a great walk and he had a great presence, right? right? So he, he represented to you that he's a Maserati frame. And, and you look at the chassis, and, and that chassis is a Volkswagen chassis. I, I, I think that's what... I am starting to see more and more, well not more and more, but I, I'm starting to identify the horses that are represented as, as really, really good horses that have the inherent right to go and, and to run a mile and a quarter in the Kentucky Derby, say, uh, right, but they just don't have the capacity from a heart standpoint or a biomechanical standpoint. So I, I agree, you, you have to use the gut feel and you have to use the, the art of it, but I love the fact that we've been able to combine those two. And I, I, I do think it's helped us um, right, with a number of horses. But you know, there's still gonna be plenty of horses that you're gonna buy that you're gonna have high hopes for that are just not gonna be fast enough uh, to compete in the big leagues and they're gonna end up at a less or on a lesser circuit. Right? That's gonna happen and, and we, see, we see people spend a lot of money in, this, in, the, in the business all over the world uh, that don't really have the results that other people have Right, spending a lot less money. So I, I think, sure, it's, his, it's an art, but I like the fact that we've been able to, I think, uh, combine the art and, and the science of our business, and I'd, I'd like to think every year we get a little smarter at it. One quick question. We're going to bring up the, the rest of our panel in a second. Aaron, you were mentioning budgets. How easy is it to stay within budgets? Say, say you're here sitting front row, bidding on a horse. You've done all your homework, vetted out. You're happy with all the looks, the confirmation comes in, you look up at the screen, and now we're twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 over budget. How easy is it to say no in, a, in an arena like this, maybe rather than a private purchase where you don't have that emotion and the heartbeat and watching the, watching the, the price go up in front of you? Yeah, there's no doubt that the adrenaline starts pumping yeah. in this pavilion. Um, and discipline is key. It's absolutely key. Um, as Terry was referring to, you do your short list, you do your vetting, you narrow your list down, you know exactly which horses you're going to fire bullets at. 
Um, but discipline is absolutely key because there's always another horse. And you know, you could get caught up in the moment and you could lose your wits, but uh, at the end of the day, you gotta stick to your guns because if you wanna be in this business long term, you've gotta stay disciplined, you gotta stick to your budget, and you gotta learn when it's time to walk out those two glass doors and say, I've had enough and I'm not gonna press, let's go look at the next one. Sure. Well, that's some great information. We're gonna bring out the rest of our panel now. Uh, a couple of guys that have been involved in the industry for a long time. Um, our next gentleman, his passion for thoroughbred racing uh, started in his native island back in uh, County Meath, um, where he was raised on a horse farm. He headed to Canada, worked for uh, Winfield Farms, E.P. Taylor's Winfield Farms, the famed Winfield Farms in Canada. And not long after that, found his own bloodstock business. He then relocated here to Lexington in 19, uh, the mid-1980s, and he's been an owner breeder as well as a bloodstock agent since then. Uh, he's purchased history of over 250 winners, Breeders' Cup winners, Eclipse Award winners, and uh, numerous other races. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mike Ryan. Mike. Our next advisor uh, grew up on a cattle ranch in Northern California, uh, and he had a passion for racing from a very young age. He attended the University of California, Davis, um, and that passion of horse racing led him down the coast to Hollywood Park, where he worked uh, as a foreman, assistant trainer, made his way up through the ranks, and uh, figured after some time as an assistant that his career would be best served with a move to Kentucky. Uh, he, he became uh, head of a bloodstock division at one of the biggest farms here in central Kentucky, uh, but he ventured out on his own, and he's now had a very, very successful bloodstock brokerage firm, uh, and that gentleman is Pete Bradley. Pete, come on out. Thanks for joining us, Pete. Take a seat. Um, We'll focus some questions in from, from Mike and Pete. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I know you, you guys bet. are very Thank busy you. this time of year. Uh, I'm going to get to an issue now that many prospective owners here would really like a clear answer about, and that's the, the role of an agent and an advisor uh, when you're going to the sale or when you're making purchases or as far as mating mares. Mike, would you like to expand on that? Uh, I guess the first uh, thing you'd like to, first of all, you try to establish a clear communication with the client what their goals are, what their objectives are, what their comfort level is as far as budget. Um, try to find out, are they, are they just buying to race or do they want to buy uh, prospects that have breeding potential afterwards as in fillies or stallions. And just to get a general idea of what they really want to accomplish in the business, explain to them the, the cost factor going in, you know, so that they're very clear explain to them the time frame that, it is, that is involved to buy a horse here at Keeneland to take them to the winner's circle and give them a very clear understanding of what it takes to, uh, to find the winner's circle. There's no doubt, as it's been said here several times today, I mean, this is the greatest game played outdoors. And, you know, we that are in it and that are owners, you know, um, the, the, the sheer excitement and pleasure and satisfaction is, you can't put a, can't put a price on it, it's really unbelievable. Um, and, you know, I think if, if you gotta make the, the client comfortable and let them tell you what they wanna do and uh, how, how they wanna proceed and, you know, what their comfort level is as far as spending and then, then you give them a plan and you try to, you try to educate them that you need to give it a plan. It needs to be, you know, somewhere in four or five years. You just can't do it one year, and then, you know, if you have if you have the patience, we need a few things. You need patience, time, a lot of luck, and money. But if if you if you combine all four and give it a chance, I'm very confident you can be successful. A lot of money can be made in this game. You make good choices. You make good decisions. You can be successful. And it all starts with buying the right stock. It's like recruiting high school kids to go to football uh, players in college or basketball players. You've got to start with the right horse. And, and if you do, don't cut corners. Do it right. Be patient. Believe me, you will be rewarded. Pete, how do you see your role as an agent or an advisor in uh, the industry you, today? Mike hit a lot of the key words. I think the first, especially when you're dealing with new owners, is education. You have to educate them to the process of buying horses. And through that, you have to get feedback from them on what they want, what their needs and their expectations are. And like Mike said, you need a plan. 
without a plan, it's a rudderless ship. You know, you buy a horse here, you buy a horse there. Um, one of your old owners, I remember when he first came to uh, the CTBA sale years ago with Jack Robbins, a man with a lot of wealth. Uh, Jack got up to, he was his advisor, he got up to get a Coca-Cola and he came back and this gentleman said, uh, I just bought a Roberto Colt. He goes, what did you do that for? He goes, well, he was only going for 200,000. So without a plan, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. Um, that being said, um, the relationship you develop has to be on trust. Uh, the more you can teach a new owner, I think the better off the whole relationship is. You would agree with that, Aaron, just to expound it? I mean, you're, you'd be working with people like Mike and Pete around the sales? And Absolutely. I mean, the, the key, and in, in, in their role as advisors, I mean, the key for owners is really to surround yourself with talented people with a track record who you trust and at the end of the day can go to dinner with and have a nice time. That's you know, the underlying you, theme we've heard. You want to enjoy yourself yep. and, and communication is the real common denominator through all of that. So yeah, I agree with all of it that these guys are saying and also, you know, discipline, you know, and you want these guys to be able to keep a, an, an over exuberant new owner because it's so easy to get caught up in this, uh, in this game and want to overspend. But yeah, if you've got advisors like these two gentlemen at the end of the, at the, end of the podium here, um, you're going to be in good shape. Yeah, because I think our industry is, is unique like, unlike any other. The reason you probably get into this sport, I don't know whether many of you agree with me, is because you've probably been successful in, in your business or, or venture, whatever it may be, outside of horse racing. And I've seen in my experience over the years, even as a trainer, sometimes you'll take those icons of industry who are very good in the corporate world, Wall Street, or investments, and they try to apply the same principles here. And unfortunately, it's probably not going to work without a team behind you. Would you agree with that, Pete? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, the problem is, is that they sometimes, those people who have a team in their own industries, think they can go it alone. Yeah, that's right. And that's where, the, because, you know, because they are successful. And again, it's developing relationships with people. As Aaron said, trying to find the best people you can, having a comfort level, and then moving forward and hope you get lucky. All right. Well, this next question might be a little tough because all you guys have had tremendous success. But Pete, I'll start with you. Out of all your successes, uh, what would be one, one of the highlights of your career? Oh, it, um, well, there's nothing better than recency. And last week, day at the spa, won the first lady here a grade one. Uh, not a grade one, one of the preeminent grade ones for turf fillies. She has now earned over a million dollars off an $85,000 purchase price. Um, and here she is. And, uh, it doesn't get much better than this guy. Yeah. Let's take a look at this. Dead spark. The leader from the second position by a length and a half. And then Somali Lemonade is third up on the outside. Sassy Kitten still there, but still fourth against the rail. Four lengths off the lead. Discreet Mark and Falimbi side by side. Falimbi looking toward the inside. Discreet Mark and Better Lucky have to go wide. Six lengths from the front. And here's Day at the Spa for the lead. Somali Lemonade has to pick it up now because Day at the Spa has gotten by his Stanford and leads it past the eighth pole with Falimbi coming late down toward the rail. Discreet Mark, better lucky to the outside, but Day at the Spa has the lead. Falimbi still trying, better lucky for outside. Late run from center court. Day at the Spa takes it for John Velasquez in one minute, 35 no and one Disneyland. fifth seconds. We're going to the Breeders' Cup. <laughs> <laughs> You know, those kinds what, of... What was your role here, though, Pete? I mean, you're in, you know, you, 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 you um, create meetings and nicks and, and purchases. What was your role here with Day of the Spa? Um, she was it, put into a racing partnership. Yep. Um, on a smaller level, I do a little bit like these two guys yep. do over here. And um, a few years back, when the New York program looked like it was going to take off with the slots and all, I put together a bunch of people to buy some New York breads. Uh, we were only able to buy one New York bred and two other horses that uh, went on to not much of anything but nice little horses and this one New York bred has kind of made us famous. And you were associated with St. Liam as well, right? Uh, Mike this, was. Mike is, yes. Yeah. yeah. Would yeah. that be one of the highlights for you, Mike, St. Liam? Yeah, I've been very blessed. We've bought three Breeders' Cup winners, bred a Breeders' Cup winner, but I'd say when you buy a Breeders' Cup Classic winner that turns out to be horse of the year, it, it really can't get much better than that. We're, we're missing the Derby, the but we're still working on it. Ready for the start. Let's take a look at St. Liam. That's him in the outside and the pinkies going far outside. 
There he is there. And what was your involvement with St. Liam? At what point did you purchase him? I bought him as a yearling at Saratoga. Um, he was bred by the late Mr. Evans. I had a lot of success buying horses from Mr. Evans. And uh, he has a great program and raises great horses. And um, as a, he was bought at Saratoga. We were going to pinhook him, to be honest. And I said to Mr. Warren, I, I think this horse is going to bring a lot of money. He said, what do you think? And I said, well, it wouldn't shock me if he brought 300. And he said, well, use your judgment. We got him for 140, so needless to say, we weren't able to pin hook him, but it was, it was a great thrill for me for him to go on and achieve the heights that he did. And unfortunately, he, he uh, only had one year at stud, but he did sire a champion in Harvard de Grace. And uh, he's sitting there in fourth with Jerry Bailey. It was a great position because he was drawn on the far outside. The gate is parked on the corner at the, at the man the quarter start. So he did a great job to get him in position there. And he's just sitting moving comfortably without being asked yet. And that's uh, Flower Alley in front of him with the, with the yellow cap and the blue, and it was a real horse race from here. But uh, this was his crowning race and uh, made him a stallion prospect. And it was a tragedy that uh, he only uh, served one year at study, died in a fractured a leg, and they had to uh, put him to sleep. It's Jerry Bailey on him, I think. Anybody's race there. He really had to run hard here to beat the three year old Flower Alley. Two really good horses. Flower Alley wouldn't go away, as you can see. I think Billy always had it, though. Really, uh, That's a true, great story. Of, from, <laughs> from a yearling all the way to, to, the, to the biggest race on our stage here yeah, domestically. It's, it's pretty special. You know, you, you get very close to the owners and you help them all along the way, you know, select the person to break the horse, to develop in the early stages, and then the next, the next, the final part of the puzzle is to put them in the right hands to, to you know, finish it off and uh, win the best races. What are, what are some of the pitfalls if you don't have an advisor, Terry? Where can you go wrong if, if you don't have the kind of advice these guys are giving at the end? Well, I think one of the big things uh, is on the veterinarian side, right? Mm -hmm. If you haven't right, gone through you know, the good and the bad on the veterinarian side and what things you can accept, because the key is, right, you're never going to get a perfect horse. And the veterinarians, right, Jeff Burke will come out and talk to us about, uh, about right, the vet's role in the process. I, I think. I think a lot of times, right, people that don't have advisors that are new to the game, right, if, if a problem is identified, they back off right away. And there are plenty of examples of really good horses that go on to great success, right, that had issues at either the yearling uh, or the two-year-old sale. So I think that's one of the things, uh, right, when you put a good team together, all the, um, all the experience is really put to use, especially on the veterinarian side. All right, give us some insight, Mike and Pete. We've heard about uh, you're the experts, you give all the advice. Give us some secrets. Uh, what are some of the things you look for? Trade secrets. Well, There's nobody I'd listening. Say, We're just... Well, <laughs> uh, I mean, the first thing I look for is balance and frame. That you want a horse that looks like an athlete, you want the angles to be right. Uh, I think second is presen presence. And it's such a nebulous thing to say, well, that horse has presence. Uh, it's everything from his movement, how he uses himself, uh, to his demeanor, uh, to his attitude. You come back and you look at a horse a second and third time and it's getting sulky and sour, may not have the attitude you want for a racehorse. You know a horse that's got all of the tools, you come back and you know he's been looked at a hundred times and he's still walking out there like he's the king of the world, that's the horse I want. So there's, there's a whole group of things that experience tells you. Um, and I think the first thing is, is try to like a horse first, find a horse, that horse that makes you say, Wow, I like that horse. And then see if you can live with the faults that he has confirmation-wise. Uh, most of us end up being too critical on the horses we buy. We pass up more good horses than you know we probably should by being too critical. Mike, real quick. I know because it's a question I used to get asked a lot. How, how can you tell that all these horses look the same to me, to the new eye? What are some of the things you look for? I, I agree with everything Pete said. I'll go a step further. There's a couple of things I really focus in on. I think we're too critical. 
I learned at an early age, runners come in all shapes, colors, makes, and sizes. You see that here in November when you see the broodmare sold, or you go to the stallion farms and look at different stallions. But I put a great emphasis on a horse's demeanor, what I call class factor. I've never seen a good horse that didn't have class. Good horses are smart. They handle stress well. They just, they just rise up, uh, you know, they, they, when you need a fight, when they're coming through a hole, they got the heart to do it. Class is very, very important. And the other thing I, I really look for is movement. I like horses that are light on their feet that move over the ground easy. That's not to say that a horse is not a good walker. He can't be a runner because AP Indy comes to mind. He was not a good walker, but he was a great racehorse. But, but I, t I agree with everything that Pete said too. And you know, beauty is in the eye of the observer. I mean, if we all liked the same horse, it would be a very boring, you know, situation. But uh, and that's what gives everybody a chance. You know, you, everybody likes a different kind of horse. Everybody has a preference: turf, dirt, you know, certain sire lines. And you, and you, you sometimes you give a preference. You like one sire line over another, and you know, and you, you get your, you get to know what you like. All right, we're going to bring out a couple more members uh, to complete this panel, and these are the people that are involved before we purchase the horse and after we purchase the horse. He's a graduate, graduate of the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine, and then he began practicing uh, as a racetrack vet and then moved to Ocala, specialized in young horses and sales work. He served on num numerous boards, AAEP, Florida Association of Equine Practitioners, and the National Association of Two-Year-Old Consigners. He lives currently and resides here in Lexington. He's part of the Equine Medical Associates Group, and his primary practice uh, is international thoroughbred sales work. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jeffrey Burke. Thanks for coming, Jeff. Sorry, thank you. Uh, our next panel member is a name going to be familiar to many of you. He took an unconventional route here to the thoroughbred world uh, and the Thoroughbred Racing Hall of Fame. Uh, he's the only inductee in the Hall of Fame uh, who's also in the Texas Cowboy Hall of Fame and the Professional Bull Riders Ring of Honor. He made the transition from rodeo athlete to thoroughbred trainer. He enjoyed a remarkable career training, including the first trainer to uh, train the Breeders' Cup Juvenile and win the Kentucky Derby the following year with the same horse. Uh, he has scores of victories in top-notch races, the Travis, Florida Derby, Apple Blossom, and the Super Derby, just to name a few. You'll remember this name, that great stretch run of unbridled. It's Carl Nasca, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, thanks for coming. Um, appreciate your time here this afternoon. Carl, I want to start with you. Um, I think most people that are getting into this sport believe that a trainer's role, uh, as far as the horse, begins when he gets to the racetrack. Do, do you think that's true? Is there an element where the trainer can get involved prior to the horse just showing up at the track? Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for letting me come here and speak. And, uh, Yes, I, the trainer, I had a great relationship with Mr. Jim Tappel. And uh, we got together and the trainer role before we ever go there is to understand the owner and help the owner select what he wants to do. It's been covered very well today. The things that are important to you has to be important to the trainer. The thing that is important to Mike and ever, all, anybody that's helping you and advising you, they have to understand what you want in this business. What do you want to get out of it? What is your goals? And you have to have a good program. So yes, I, Taffel, Mr. Taffel and I have had a great relationship. We stood toe to toe, nose to nose many a time, but we worked it out and we made a decision and we went forward. And if it worked, Nobody ever said anything. If it didn't work, you just went to the next option. So when you align yourself with a client like Mr. Taffel and you've got a relationship, you're involved from, you know, early on from the foals, you'd look at the, you, the horses that you would eventually get to train as foals, yearlings, you would follow them through their growth stages? We would, uh, before Mr. Taffel and I went together, we had uh, two or three meetings. I think I was covered very good in the relationship of owner trainer. Uh, we had like two or three meetings. He'd already been in with Cot Campbell partnerships like Terrett's and, and Aaron's. And uh, he came there and we got on the same page of what he was looking for, what he wanted to do. And then we talked about how we would approach it. And uh, that's how we approached our sales. We, we discussed everything. And we 
we were definitely on the same page all the time. Dr. Burke, I'll move to you and ask you a couple of questions because we've heard the importance of the vet and vetting horses out at sales. Um, this is a multifaceted question. First of all, what's your role in selecting the thoroughbred and the specific tasks that you as a vet perform? Uh, we'd like to hear about those and, and give us some insight to the risk level, even with the, the most soundest of horses. I mean, everything can look good on x-rays, but problems can still occur. I think that probably the most, uh, the best analogy that I could give about what I do for, for these people, it's that of like a portfolio manager because my job is really to identify risk in the form of uh, when I do my examination of the horses, which I'll go into in just a second, and then try to uh, understand the client's level of risk and have good communication with them so that at the end of the day, they're able to purchase the horses that they'd like to purchase if possible. Um, what, I, what I don't do is I function best as a member of a team and that means that I'm working with bloodstock agents and or owners or potential owners. And so what I don't do is pretend that I'm a bloodstock agent. I don't, I don't pick these horses. They, I, am, I get a list from the, uh, two of the people right here I work for, um, Pete and Terry and uh, many other people, and I basically get a list which is called the short list, and that is, that is what the group of horses that they're interested in after they have gone through all the horses that they're interested in looking at, and they give me the short list, and my job at that point is to examine those horses, which basically consists of a, a good physical examination, um, and then looking at their throats with an endoscope to make sure that their throat function is, is proper, and then looking at the radiographs that are, that here at Keeneland, there's a repository. Uh, it's a room right over there where, where we have viewing stations and we're able to look at the standard set of radiographs of each horse looking at bone issues. And so I basically assemble all of that information and then we talk. And that's the most important part of the whole process is, is once I've done that, that we're talking and I'm communicating to them properly not just what the findings are, but what the level of risk is involved. And the reason that that's important is because they, they have a list of horses, and if they're talented at what they do, they pretty much pick some good horses, and I'm very reluctant to take any of those horses off of that list unless, and I don't, actually. I never say to anybody uh, one of two things, either buy this horse or don't buy this horse. What I, what I am saying is here's the findings, here's the level of risk that we have, and the level of risk might be, uh, it, it might be within what that client is comfortable with, in which case they, that what I'm helping to do not only is to quote unquote vet the horse, but to establish value for them so that when they're bidding on the horse in the ring, they, they know approximately what level of risk they're dealing with and how, how high they're willing to go to get that particular horse. So, so basically, it's not just a simple pass or fail system. It, it rarely would be something like that. And there, there are many good examples of horses that have turned out to be really good horses that had veterinary findings that were, to some degree, risky. That's some great insight there, yeah, because I, I think potential owners come in and think, you know, an x-ray that's not 100% is an absolute scratch off the list, and that's definitely not the case. No, as a matter of fact, it may, it, it may actually enable somebody to buy a horse that they really want if everybody else feels that the risk is too high. And there's been many a horse that's been purchased that way for a good value. I mean, basically what uh, Carl and I were talking earlier, and he mentioned something to me that I'm already aware of, which is that anybody can go pay too much money for a great looking horse with no veterinary problems and a great pedigree. That's not, that's not what we're doing here. We're trying to find value, and so um, they come in all shapes and sizes. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, real quick. I remember working with a, a very good Grade One horse whose name remained nameless and had no medical problems. And at the end of one year, we decided, oh, let's just do a, a year in review and X-rays, and wish we'd never done it. What we found, <laughs> and, and wouldn't have known any different if we hadn't right. taken the X-rays. Right. right. Carl, back to you. Um, Look, you don't, you don't get into the Hall of Fame just like that. You've had tremendous success, and uh, I want to bring up a clip now of one of your biggest successes. You mentioned Jim Taffel, Street Sense. Um, let's take a look at uh, Street Sense for Carl.
call Nesca. Let's roll the clip. They're all set. And away they go. Circular Key took a little bump shortly after the start and is going to drop back last. Stormello is going to go on to set the early pace. Scat Danny showing early speed, but he too was in tight and had a drop back. There's Principal Secret and Pegasus Wind on the outside. They're sprinting early on. Just in behind the leaders now, we have got the last lap, and then there's Malt Magic. Scat Daddy is down at the rail, three and a half off the leaders. King of the Rocks, he's up alongside of him. CP West is racing back in the eighth position, giving them seven length start. Up alongside of those two, we have Great Hunter now is towards the rear. Then we come back to Teufelsberg, being followed then by Skip Code, who's racing back fourth last. A long way back here to Street Sense, UD Getter, and Circular Key is last, and Circular Key's got to be 20 lengths off these leaders. They go to the half mile and principal secret in the red colours takes the advantage but they've been going some pace up here. Stormello's already ridden along down at the rail. Pegasus wind. Now there goes Scat Daddy on the outside. He's hooked four wide but Scat Daddy goes to take them on. CP West is running on behind that and let's see Circular Key starting his run now. He's a good 12 off them. Circular Key making good ground if he can find a way through and then Street Sands at the top of the lane. Pegasus wind. Scat Daddy breeze down his neck on the outside. On alongside of those two now, here comes Great Hunter. And Great Hunter now just goes right on by them. Circular Key from last on the grandstand side. Homeward bound Circular Key coming out gamely on the centre of the track. But it's not going to get to Street Sense. He's gone well clear as they come for home now. And it's going to be Street Sense to win this one in distant. Street Sense could not have been more impressive. He robs. It'll be Circular Key second. Great Hunter finishes third and Scat Daddy was fourth. Doesn't get old, does it, Carl? No. <laughs> um, you, 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 touched on, you touched on this earlier. Um, talk about your uh, association with Street Sense. I mean, you, you've touched that you were involved with Jim Taffel. Were, were you involved in selecting this horse right from the get-go? This horse was the homebred. All of uh, Mr. Taffel's major horses were homebred. When we uh, sat down in Chicago in 1984, we laid out. He wanted to get into breeding his own, racing his own, being his own stable and buying every year to add to it. But uh, this was a mare that, the descendant that we bought from uh, Lee Eaton and a uh, mare called uh, Majestic Legend, she ended up winning 200,000. And uh, then she was a dam of uh, Bedazzle. Bedazzle made 200,000. Majestic let her produce some stakes horses, but nothing like Bedazzle then produced street sense. And uh, Banshee Breeze was another one that we bought. And you're talking about uh, horses having uh, minor, not really sale yearlings. Uh, the dam of Banshee Breeze was uh, Banshee Winds. And we, I think Mr. Taffel paid 52000 for her. He paid 75000 for Majestic Legend. But he was a, Mr. Taffel was a great manager of uh, a racing stable. Uh, in this horse here was bred, and I'll tell you a quick story, and this uh, Healy Bell messed up, I messed up. Uh, neither one of us approved uh, the horse he was going to breed to, Street Cry. And uh, Mr. Taffel says, you got to vote, and Healy's got to vote, and he says, but I got the best vote. We're going to Street Cry. And that was the, the, the that was Street the Cry was bred then to Bedazzle, Bedazzle then, was street sets. So, so uh, that, that gives you an idea of working in communication with an owner where they want to go, but remember, you're the one that needs to know where you're going and enjoy the sport. It's great. Some great insight, uh, Carl. Absolutely. And, and, and in Street Sense case, when you're training for homebreds, would you have the kind of knowledge uh, of the, the x-rays and, and, and uh, of the horse, say, as opposed to a sale horse, which has already gone through numerous endoscopes, numerous x-rays, would you do that back at the farm and, oh. and look for early problems before they get to you? You definitely look at a, at a baby, see if there's something you need to do, see, clean them up a little. But the main thing you want to do is watch them grow, their health records and what they're doing. And then when you bring them in, you've got a big advantage because you know the family that they came from. You knew Majestic Legend. You trained Bedazzle. You trained Majestic Legend. You, you got an idea of what you're dealing with. And then he shows extraordinary talent. And you say, wow, this is a good sound family. 
and uh, we could have a real live, really top horse in street sets, and fortunately we did. Well, great insight uh, from all our panel. We're going to do something a little different here in just a second. We've heard how, how we select these horses. Now we're going to get down to business and uh, this very sale ring where the majority of the horses are sold that we've been talking about. I'm going to call on the Associate Director of Sales here at Keeneland, Tom Thornbury, to join us in just a second. But I need Team Wellman and Team Finley. Can you take your positions, please? Yeah. Sounds a little ominous, right? <laughs> Let's go, Team. Uh oh, come on. You're with the one. I think I'd you like guys to tell are. You this next horse coming in is smashing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Tom. Tom Thornbury. Uh, I'll hand it over to you. Here he is, Associate Director of Sales, Tom Thornbury. Great. Great Thanks work. very much. Welcome to Keeneland. Our hope is now, to dispel any fear that you have there. about the sales auction okay. prospect. And uh, on my right is. Walt Robertson, Vice President of Sales, who will be doing the auctioneering. And on my left, Kurt Becker, the voice of Keeneland. Now, the first thing that I would say, after listening to the advisors earlier, is that there's one, I would go with everything that they told you, with one exception, I would say, throw the discipline out the window, because <laughs> <laughs> we, want, we want you to swing for the fences. <laughs> Every time. Bid with abandon. So, but uh, realistically, uh, this is uh, 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 hallowed ground for us, and uh, we're delighted that you're here. We're going to put on kind of a, an auction to give you an idea of the flavor of the process. But uh, first, we'll kind of walk you through uh, the whole thing as horses arrive here at Keeneland and right up until they come in the back door here. To the auction ring. So, if you would, Judy, roll the tape. Horses uh, come from all over the country here. We sell 4,000 horses in September, uh, yearlings, and we sell 4,000 in November, all breeding stock, uh, racing prospects, stallion prospects, broodmare prospects, and weanlings. And then in January, we come back with 2,500 more. Uh, that's horses of all ages. And then in April, we have a one-day horses of uh, racing age sale, uh, two-year-olds in training, ready to run. Uh, we breeze them here at the racetrack, and a couple of days later, sell them. But uh, we have uh, space for a little over 1,500 horses at one time, and 4,000 are sold within two weeks' time. So we sell roughly 400 horses every day. Uh, there's a horse for every pocketbook and a horse for, for every person out there. Uh, we have uh, a process here through the conditions of sale, which are included in our Bible here, the, the sale catalog. Uh, you can also download the sale catalog onto your iPad that you received uh, here. Uh, the, um, the sale process is as uh, transparent as we can possibly make it. We want both the buyer and the seller to have the very best experience. We have a repository here of x-rays, 38 different views of each horse in the sale for the veterinarians to have a good look at prior to sale so that you as a buyer uh, can bid with confidence. Uh, again, uh, as the horses enter the ring, uh, we want you to throw that discipline out the window. So uh, why don't we sell a horse, fellas? That sounds good, Tom, and thank you. And folks, we do welcome you to the Keeneland Sales Pavilion. And our offering today is a Colt by Giants Causeway, consigned by Bow Lane Bloodstock as agent, by Giants Causeway, out of Rebridled Dreams, by Unbridled Song, by Giants Causeway, European Horse of the Year, three-time champion sire in North America, over 150 career stakes winners, top three again this year on the general sire list. This out of a stakes winning mare, this colt, a half brother to four winners from four to race, including the grade one winning juvenile, JB's Thunder. Here's Walt. 
All right, sir. And how many dollars to give? Who gave me to give five hundred thousand dollars to give money to me? I've got twenty-five thousand. Fifty at twenty-five. Fifty. Everybody give money to give fifty. Everybody give seventy-five. Now everybody hundred at a hundred twenty-five. At a hundred now twenty-five. Everybody give one forty-five. One forty-five. One fifty. At one forty-five. One fifty. Everybody give fifty. One fifty. One fifty now seventy-five. At a hundred fifty thousand dollars to give seventy-five. One seventy-five. Two hundred at two hundred. Two twenty-five at two twenty-five. Two fifty at two forty-five. Now fifty. Everybody give fifty. Fifty seventy-five. Yep. At two seventy-five. Everybody give seventy-five. Everybody give money to give seventy-five. Three hundred. 325 at 300 to get 350 400 at 400 450 at 400 dollar 50 everybody mama to get money to get 50 everybody mama to get 50 at 400 50 everybody mama to get 50 everybody mama to get 25 at 400 everybody mama to get 45 at 25 50 at 425 50 75 500 at 500 dollar to go 5 5 everybody to get 500 now 25 at 500 now 25 everybody get 25 at 525 everybody mama to get 25 500 now 25 at 500 25 at 500 now 25 500 dollar to get 25 the 525, 50, 35, 50. At 535, 550, that number to get 50. At 535, everybody get 50. Everybody, mama, everybody get 50. Yep. At 50, 75. At 550, everybody get 75. Everybody get 75. Kurt, we got a nice horse in the ring. And a colt with a two-turn pedigree here by Giants Causeway. Don't forget the half brother J. B. Thunder, a Grade One winner at two around two turns. And I have 550, everybody think it's 75, everybody think it's 75. All through it, 550,000, nobody goes 75, everybody think it's 75. At 550,000, all 75, right quick. At 575, everybody think it's 75. 550,000, nobody goes 75. Last call, 550,000, nobody goes 75. All through, 550, 75. 75, sir, everybody think it's 75. Sold it to you, $550,000. Thank you. Nicely done, Team Wellman. And uh, uh, at this point, uh, we'd like to kind of know just exactly what it is you bought. So if we can look a little, little bit ahead, I guess. Carpe Diem is challenging Conquest Tsunami, and Carpe Diem has a head in front. Conquest Tsunami second at the quarter pole, gap of five more lengths. Mr. Z being ridden along to third, down toward the inside, but six lengths off the lead. Into the short stretch, final furlong of the Claiborne Breeders' Futurity, and Carpe Diem has the advantage. Opens up with every stride here, a widening five-length margin. Conquest Tsunami second, Mr. Z is third, and Carpe Diem has seized the day at Keeneland. He just continues to draw a clear. What an impressive two-year-old Keeneland sales grad Carpe Diem to take it convincingly. Mr. Z was home second, Bold Conquest third, one minute 43 and one-fifth seconds. Indeed, Carpe Diem, the sales graduate of whom we spoke, and congratulations to the connections. We certainly wish all the best to all of the Keeneland sales grads who are heading to the West Coast in just a couple of weeks for the Breeders' Cup. And no doubt Carpe Diem will be among those vying for favoritism in that Breeders' Cup juvenile. Folks, thank you for being with us for this auction here this afternoon. Kurt, Tom, and Walt, thank you. thanks very much. First of all, Aaron, you got deep pockets. You went to 550, or Pete did. No, was there discipline there? <laughs> Exactly, as, as you know, Carpe Diem won the Breeders' Futurity here at Keeneland. Uh, opening weekend is now the favorite for the, uh, for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Before we get to some questions on the floor, I want to ask either team, let's start here with uh, Pete and Aaron. What, what's, what's your, I don't want to get too close to speaking, what's, what's your feeling like during the bidding process? Obviously, this was a reenactment, but when you're live here and dollars are on the line, what are you feeling? Is the adrenaline rush? Well, actually, it's kind of calm until you get close to being at a price that you think you have a chance to buy. Um, you partly you're trying to figure out what the auctioneers are doing, who's bidding on the horse. Sometimes you can get a feel that maybe that one more extra push will get you there. So there's a lot of dynamics that go into it while the auction's going on. Here. So yeah, I'll, I'll echo uh, Pete's sentiments. You know, there's certainly a lot of excitement, a lot of adrenaline. Um, you've got to keep your composure and your poise. That's that's number one. When you're the horse that you're bidding on is coming into the ring, you got to take a deep breath and really um, gather yourself. Um, but there's all sorts of emotions. If, if there's a horse that you really like that's stuck on a low number, you're wondering, 
you're looking at your catalog page, you're looking at the horse, am I bidding on the right horse here? This horse isn't bring enough money. And sometimes that could create a negative vibe where it, it you know, why is this horse so quiet on the board? Um, and there's other times where it's frustrating because your budget just gets shot right through, you know, before you can blink an eye. Um, but really, like Pete was saying, when you're in your sweet spot and that hammer hasn't dropped quite yet and you're just on your bid and, you know, the auctioneer is about to drop the hammer, you're thinking to yourself, drop the hammer already. This is the value I want. Those five you know? seconds so, feel like... Yeah, minutes, those right? five seconds between, you know, last call and drop the hammer can seem like an eternity. But, uh, no, you run the gambit of emotions and, and you know, Keeneland does a great job and, and, you know, I think they get to know their bidders, their clients, and they'll know what button to push to try to squeeze that last bid out of you and, and bump up the price. But I'll stick to my guns and say that discipline is key no matter what. What's your favorite bid? I mean, do you, I know Wayne Lucas used to bid with his foot. Pete, are you a finger guy, an arm guy, a pro, uh, catalog guy? <laughs> There's no Jack LaLanne when it comes to bidding. You're <laughs> jumping Jack. You, you want to be subtle. And usually you have a bid spotter who knows when you're in there, you're there to bid. Team Finley, Terry, talk about your, some of your emotions here as I try to get inside your head when you're bidding on a horse. Well, I think there are two things that I think about. I, when I sign the when I sign a slip for a horse after we bought them, I I, I always think is uh, the horse we just bought the one, or the horse that's going to take us to the Kentucky Derby uh, or the Kentucky Oaks. So that's the first thing. The other thing I think about is I sign my name and I, I look around and I say to myself, I'm the only one out of, out of the whole pavilion, out of all these people that thinks uh, that this horse is worth. <laughs> Uh, the amount that I just signed for. So I think that kind of uh, puts everything in, into perspective. But you, know, you have to buy good ones, and, and then you have to put them in good hands, and, and you got to have success on the racetrack. But you know, this is really the start right here in, in, uh, in the auction ring, and it's an incredible and, and exciting experience, to say the least. Mike, have you ever leaned in during an, uh, a bidding war and said to your client, look, we just need to, to back off here and, and step away? Eric says you got to use some judgment, but I, I think when you really land on a horse that you, you feel really strong about, I don't think you can buy him for twenty-five or fifty thousand. Uh, you know, most people are very thorough, very prepared in what they do. And when I walk in to see a horse that's selling, I'm looking around and I'm looking for the competition. And invariably, I look over to see somebody that's got more money than I do, like Jack Wolf or Frankie Brothers. And <laughs> it's a constant battle, but. You know, it's a great feeling when the hammer drops and, and it just, it's a, you're in your comfort level and it just feels good. Um, and, and you know when you're out of your comfort level, you know, that's just, well, there's another horse. As Aaron says, there's lots more horses and lots of times I've worked with a limited budget and I will buy a horse any shape, color, size. If, it, if, it, if I see, if the big picture looks good, if the package looks good to me and I get a good feel from it, I'll buy a horse that will be under the radar, but it, it's a good feeling when you think you got, it, you got it right and you got it under budget. Pete, what about you? You've got a client, you're in the middle of a bidding war, you've got a client on your arm, he wants to go the extra 10, 20, 50,000, you don't think it's appropriate, what do you say? Yeah, um, I tell him to set a limit, you know, again, if a horse is worth, let's say you're looking at a $100,000 horse, and that's what you value it, you know, is it worth 110 or 120? Probably. You know, is it worth 10 to 15 percent more? It's when you decide at that range, no, you don't want to go to 200 for it, or maybe the budget doesn't allow you to go that far. So you you basically have to nicely say, um, you know, it's to, it's that's enough for this one. There's more coming, and people get frustrated, especially if you're at a sale for two or three days and you don't get a horse, and you know you've seen some you really like, and that frustration builds because there's a lot of money bidding against you for these horses. There's a lot of people that. Uh, have the experience and the pocketbooks to, when you find the horses you like, because we don't try to buy horses we don't like just to fill orders. Right. We try to buy horses that we think have a chance to be athletes. Everybody here is pretty much on the same page. And not that we all look for the same horse, but there are multiple people usually on a good horse, not just one. Um, so you have to be disciplined, especially if you're working within a budget. So if you do three or four days work here, yeah. groundwork, you don't yeah. walk away with a horse, don't be upset. Yeah. There's always another sale around the And corner. there was only one time when I was younger that I was frustrated, and I had a client that had a lot of money. And, and I was probably a little young at the time to be spending that kind of money. Uh, this horse I told him to bid 300000 on, 
when it got to 500, I said to him, are we spending Monopoly money? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. that's the thing, you've got to keep yourself in check because you can, you know, as they say in the racetrack, get the tongue over the bit and run off with what you're spending. All right, that's some great insight. We have about three or four minutes left here, so I, I think now's a good time to take some, some questions from the floor, and I'm sure there's plenty of them with, with the group we have assembled here ready to answer them. So anyone on the floor with some questions? Nope. Yes, sir. Did everyone, if nobody heard the question in the back, the question was how important is size when you're buying a horse? Big, small, indifferent. Guys, I'll start with you. It depends, like a lot of people penalize horses unnecessarily for being small. It, a lot depends on their foaling date. Uh, if it's a family that grows in time. I, I got schooled many years ago. I looked at Nuriev and I said he was too small. Well, he turned out to be a champion racehorse in Europe, a champion sire. But, but people will penalize small horses. They want a bigger horse. But uh, Northern Dancer was 15, one and a half when he won the Derby. Lush and Groom was 15, two. So runners do come in all shapes and sizes. Hey, uh, well, Mike's right. They do penalize horses for size. As a matter of fact, Northern Dancer is a great example because they tried to sell him at the um, sale in Canada. They couldn't get 25,000 for him because of his size. Depending on what you're doing, usually I like a horse with a little more size and leg but there are plenty of small horses that are good horses, and, but the market will penalize those horses in the auction ring. More questions? I'm sure there's plenty. Yeah, Don, I think, Don Palmer. The question was, when you're buying a horse for a client, are you always thinking in terms of the classic distances? Uh, no, Mom, not at all. You're, you're thinking in terms of what that client wants and where he races. Um, I have clients that like turf horses, and so you don't necessarily look for the same kind of horse as the person who wants to go to the Derby. Um, if you have someone that says, hey, I've got 75,000, I'm going to be running at Evangeline Downs, he probably wants a sprinter. And so, you know, you, you uh, tailor what you're buying to what your clients needs and and pocketbook is more questions we have time for a couple more yes ma'am terry to hear that question the question was as far as partnerships like you and aaron have uh, how much yeah. weight and input do the trainers have? Uh, we actually don't use our trainers um, on the sales grounds, but um, after we, we put our class together, we'll, we'll partition them out. We'll send some to Kentucky. Right. The vast majority of them will go to uh, New York. A couple will go to California. So we don't uh, bring the trainers in. Our, our team has really gotten better over the years, and that's just a, you know, more of a style or a process uh, decision for me. Um, we think that it's best to send them the, either the yearlings after they've been broke down south or the two-year-olds uh, after they've, uh, they've had a chance to get over the, uh, the two-year-old sales. So it just really, you know, our choice in that respect. Aaron, what about you? I know you have a lot of trainers. You buy horses in Europe. You fit the horse to the trainer? That's exactly right. During the inspection and acquisition process, uh, my philosophy in particular is to not include trainers in that process. Um, as you've heard throughout the day today, uh, the owner-trainer dynamic is an interesting one, and there is a lot of pressure on trainers to produce results on the racetrack. Um, my opinion is, is that if you include them in the acquisition process, it adds an added layer of pressure and stress to an already stressful environment that a trainer is under. So what we do is we, can, we keep the trainers out of the selection process, and then, like Terry said, We'll look at our stock at the end of a sale and say, okay, this is where we be believe the horse belongs um, in terms of jurisdiction, and then we'll try to match what we envision that horse's strengths to be um, with the strengths of the trainer so as to be able to maximize that horse's potential ultimately. Great answer. And unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I know such a great panel, so many questions to ask. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here today. Carl Nasker, Pete Bradley, Aaron Wellman, Terry Finley, Mike Ryan, Dr. Jeffrey Burke. I think that was a very informative and knowledge panel. 
um, and the guys from Keeneland with that uh, mock auction. If you give everyone a, hand of, a round of applause, thank you.